Okay, I know the hour is late, so I'm just gonna take a few moments to uh, share slides with you. And I'll go through them fairly quickly. Okay, characteristics of effective teachers. Yeah, there's three characteristics right there. Enthusiasm, good teachers are enthusiastic. In fact, enthusiasm trumps everything else. You can not do some other things pretty good, or pretty, you can not do some other things well, but if you're enthusiastic as a teacher, it, over, it compensates for that. So I think that's very important. Okay. I think you all would agree with that. Uh, using modeling to teach. So, you know, they say you can't not teach, right? There's such a thing as active modeling and passive modeling. Generally, you're always a model when the student's watching. Is that right? Yeah. And I'll bet you that there's a lot of you who have learned by imitating the teachers that you had, right? Yeah. So that's very, very important. And we'll talk about that in some workshops, the active modeling and the passive modeling. Creating a safe learning environment. There's some research to show that that is the most important thing to students. When they're, when they're in the learning environment and learning from you, feeling that it's safe. It's a safe environment. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay to say, I don't know. Okay, very important. Explaining clearly. Yeah, explaining clearly. We all know how important that is. But sometimes, you can have so much experience and you've done something so many times that you kind of forget how to go through the detail, details of it in an explanation to the student, right? Yeah. So you kind of have to take your back, take, take yourself back to where they were when you explain things. So we'll talk about that too in some workshops. Using questions to teach clinical reason. Yeah, very important. Very important to do that. What do you think is going on with this patient? And why do you think that? And there's a, a teaching model called the five macro skills. And we can practice that model. We can learn that model in some workshops that we will have. Orient the student and set expectations. Dr. Miller talked about that uh, uh, quite a bit in, in his presentation. I think it's very important. And in a sense, when you think about Covey's First three habits, the orientation covers those. And one is be proactive. You're being proactive when you sit down with that student, okay? Beginning with the end in mind and putting, and thinking win-win. Three things that are very important as part of that orientation. How many of you, when you started some of your clerkships when you were a student, had an orientation by someone who was going to teach you. You did. One or two folks, yeah. A lot of times you got an orientation from a student who had just finished that rotation and they were telling you who to watch out for. That's the orientation you wanted, right? Yeah. So it's, it, it should be more than that and you all can do that. Okay. Aware of the rotation objectives and the requirements. And I think it's important for the students to know what the objectives are, and it's important for you all to know what those objectives are. And one of the ways that you can do that is you look in the syllabus, you look at the students' learning objectives you want them to accomplish, and you say to yourself, how can I help them accomplish these objectives? And you can have some discussion about that in that orientation. So that's very, very important. Okay, providing feedback. Well, feedback is a big deal. And you know, you've heard of the feedback sandwich. And there's research to show that the feedback sandwich is really not very effective, you know. And a lot of feedback models suffer from ineffectiveness. And one of the models that I've developed is called the ARCH model. And I'm going to leave some cards out here that have the ARCH model on it, and you can take one with you. I think I've got one for everybody. But the ARCH is A, allow for self-assessment. That's really important, isn't it? Because what do you have when a student is not good at self-assessment? How many people have ever taught a student who was not good at self-assessment 
but was very assertive. Wow. It's a scary moment for you. You call that the student from hell. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to give the opportunity to the student to self-assess a lot, right? That's how you get better. That's how you get better at something. Okay, the second part of the model is to reinforce behaviors done well. Reinforce behaviors done well. Sometimes a student, it's good to ask a, stu a student how they got good at something. And it's not a question we normally ask people. Because sometimes you can get good at something and not really know how you got there. Because you weren't thinking through it as you did it. Sometimes it's by accident. The C is to confirm what needs to be corrected. Confirm what needs to be corrected, okay? And by the way, when the student is self-assessing, you're saying something like, tell me two things that you're doing really well and two things you need to improve on. And that gets that conversation started and it makes it a lot easier. And it gives the student some control of the situation. Okay, so we've got A, R, C. C is, it is confirmed what needs correct. And then H is to help the student with a plan for improvement. And we can practice that in a workshop. And uh, Dr. Miller mentioned the term perfect practice. Another way to say that is deliberate practice. People get really good at something through deliberate practice. Okay, so, and by the way, there's a, if you want to read more about that, there's a book called Peak, and it's by Anders Ericsson. Anders Ericsson is the expert on expertise, and he's at Florida State University. So, what he says is you get, you become an expert by deliberately practicing, and that deliberate practice is based on self-assessment, on feedback, and coaching. Feedback, self-assessment, coaching. Okay. And then evaluating the student systematically. And Steve mentioned he talked about filling out the evaluation form. And one of the ways that you can tell if your if your evaluation, the numbers that you give the student are accurate is if you can back them up with some narrative. You can write some comments to back up the numbers. That really helps. Helps you, helps the student. Okay. Okay, just a couple of situations here for uh, teaching strategies. I'll just share these two with you. Preceptor interviews, examines, and works up a patient as the student observes. Then the preceptor provides a brief explanation of why he or she did the things they did. And you can just turn this around and you can say the preceptor observes as the student interviews and the examines, and then the student explains what they did. Okay, so those are just two examples, you know. And we can talk about some different teaching scenarios uh, in some of the workshops that we'll have. So I'm going to stop there because it's getting late and we really appreciate you all being here.